It is the Whitewater River, of course, that sculpted the Whitewater Valley. And it was an event that occurred here in, in, on August 19th of 2007. Um, the impact, the erosive power of the Whitewater River becomes so obvious as geologic processes are sped up. That event was the largest rainstorm in Minnesota's recorded history. It dumped a record 15.1 inches on nearby Holcomb, Minnesota from 8 a.m. on August 18th to 8 a.m. on August 19th, 2007. Here at Whitewater State Park, 11 and a half inches fell, swelling the Whitewater River to the highest level in the park's history. This event had tremendous human consequences. Unfortunately, seven southeastern Minnesotans lost their lives during the floods that, that followed the storm. Uh, many communities had significant damage. Hundreds of homes uh, made uninhabitable by the, the flood that followed. Whitewater State Park also felt the impact of this storm. During the flood, the Whitewater River changed its course by 100 feet and flooded Gooseberry Glen Campground from two directions. While cutting this new channel, the waters deposited on one riverbank an eight-foot-tall bar of gravel and rock that the flood was carrying. As the river continued to spread beyond its banks, it temporarily established a new channel down Highway 74. This water came across the campground from another direction, crashing into the bar of gravel and rock, carrying off its lower end. When the waters receded, the Whitewater River had a new course, and deep holes in the river that used to harbor large trout are now rock piles that rise several feet above the water. This kind of flooding isn't new to the park. There is evidence of large floods carving the area in ancient times as well. These flood ridges and valleys, anywhere from two to six feet tall, are remnants of ancient floods that were even larger than the one of 2007. Some of these ridges weren't touched by this recent flood, but they show that historically and prehistorically, flood waters shaped the valley floor of Whitewater State Park. On a park-wide scale, this flood caused some other significant changes in the landscape. On these before and after photos of the flood, you can see rock and gravel deposited on the meadow, the south picnic area, the beach, and the ball field. One of the largest landslides caused by the flood is clearly visible. You can also see the dramatic change in the river channel near the campgrounds. Try to imagine the power of this flood as it came through this floodplain area. There are literally hundreds of debris piles of trees and shrubs that were ripped out of the banks of the river and moved downstream. The one pile behind me is about 15 feet tall. Trees growing in the floodplain, such as cottonwoods, willows, elms, and some walnuts, were washed away by the deep, fast-flowing floodwaters. Shrubs and wildflowers were swept away also, opening up an opportunity for new plant growth. One real concern as far as the, the biological impacts of this flood is exotic species, in particular reed canary grass and garlic mustard seed washing into the park from upstream. Uh, both of those plants are in the park and we're controlling them, um, but now with newly exposed uh, soils, there's a great possibility that we may get new and large aggressive populations of those established. So watching uh, for the beginning of those infestations is something we'll be doing and trying to keep uh, control of that. Immediately after the flood of August 19th, the Whitewater River bottom was scoured clean. The silt that often filled the holes in the cobble of the dolomite rock was washed away. The Oneota dolomite rock fragments on the bottom of the stream became as light colored as the rock you see above the water. The food chain was significantly impacted. There were very few aquatic plants and very few insects feeding on those plants. Many fish, including trout, had been washed away. 
In many ways, I compare what the stream looked like immediately after the flood to a newly formed volcanic island in an ocean. The stream bed was virtually devoid of life. But a month after the flood, plants were growing again on the river bottom, and surveys done by DNR Fisheries found that trout of a variety of ages survived the flood. Life in the river began to rebound. The high velocity floodwaters carrying silt, gravel, and rock acted like liquid sandpaper, scouring clean the yellow orange Jordan sandstone and the light tan dolomite along the riverbanks. The high water level can clearly be seen where the river wore away the sandstone in which youngsters had carved their names. The river's fast moving waters also washed away terraces and islands of sediments in some areas, only to deposit them elsewhere, making new terraces and islands. Uh, in the river bed, where all the rock cobble is, we see the sandstones, we see the limestones, the dolomites, but also there's some things that might be a surprise to people. We're finding agates. There is also the possibility of finding fossils, including ones from Ice Age mammals. We could find tusks or molars from mastodons or mammoths, perhaps giant ground sloth skulls. So we're letting volunteers and staff know what could now be exposed as a result of this flood. Any natural or cultural artifacts that are found belong to the state park and need to be turned in. In this way, they can be used to tell the Whitewater State Park story. There are several places in Whitewater State Park where hillsides slid away. The soils on those steep hillsides, like other soils in the park, were saturated as a result of the heavy rain and those steep slopes, um, the, the soil gave way, carrying with it the forest and much of the rock. Um, at least two of those are 100 feet high and 50 feet wide. And the soils in Whitewater State Park are made up largely of some silt from glacial times that was blown into the area, the loose soils. And that soil, when it gets wet, is very slippery. And so those hillsides gave way, and often as a result of the Whitewater River undercutting its support down at, at the base of that slope. And so in some cases, uh, like the one behind me, you actually have the forest piled up in the river, piles of large uh, trees and rocks that came down that hillside. In many cases, we're going to set up photo stations here in the park to watch the vegetation reclaim those hillsides. This landslide caused damage to one of the park's rare features. The hillside behind me actually is a rare plant and animal community called an algific talus slope. And in this site, facing north, there are springs that seep out through the rock cobble, the talus below the rock face. And that water in winter freezes deep into the, the rock, into the bedrock behind. And in the summer, because of that north exposure, that ice does not all thaw. And so you have ice here in this community on a year-round basis. So this really is the Blufflands version of, of permafrost. And so you can well imagine that near the mouth of these caves and in that talus, it's a very cool, moist environment, and many different kinds of plants and animals live there. Uh, among the typical trees of this site, of this type of community, is the yellow birch and also white pine are in those areas. And the yellow birch that we see here are, are found nowhere else other than in these communities here in southeastern Minnesota. Fortunately, most rare species in the park do not live in the floodplain. Flood water did not reach high enough to cause much damage to these rare twin leaf wildflowers. Usually timber rattlesnakes move from the valley floor back up to their dens in the bluffs in late August. Hopefully, they escape the flood. In Minnesota, the rare pickerel frog lives only along the limestone outcrops of the streams in the Blufflands. On one of our first trips up Trout Run Creek after the flood, we were relieved to find several of these frogs. In many cases, these rare plants, animals, and communities will be monitored to see how they recover from the flood. The damage to the park's infrastructure was as impressive as the impacts on the natural resources. Current conservative estimates are that $4 million of damage was done to bridges, roads, campgrounds, and picnic areas. All totaled, 
15 of the park's 17 trail bridges were significantly damaged or destroyed. Some were washed totally away. All three of the park's interior road bridges were broken and bent beyond repair. Even bridges that weren't washed out were subject to major stress. In one case, the water rose over 16 feet, depositing flood debris on the bridge's deck. A bridge between Gooseberry Glen and Cedar Hills campgrounds was buried in debris 100 feet from the New River Channel. As part of the park's restoration, pieces of asphalt that were washed into the Whitewater River and floodplain forest from park roads and bridges will be collected and recycled. Roads and bridges weren't the only facilities damaged. One campground was totally flooded and another partially flooded. The same thing happened to the park's picnic areas. In flooded picnic areas and campgrounds, holes were eroded. They needed to be filled. In other places, piles of rock were deposited. They had to be removed. In order to save trees that were buried under sediment, staff and volunteers had to dig them out. In other cases, roots of trees were exposed by the flowing waters. To save those, their roots had to be covered. Besides the impact on the natural resources in Whitewater State Park, the flood also impacted the cultural, historical resources of the park. Behind me is a, a wall built by the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC program, in the late 1930s. This wall fell into a large hole that was eroded right in Highway 74. There were about five CCC structures in Whitewater State Park that were damaged by this flood. The other significant damage to CCC structures happened to the dam and bridge immediately downstream of the park's beach. While the flood damaged some historic features, its rushing waters revealed some hidden history. Volunteers found dishes from the CCC program of the 1930s. As work continues on the park's reconstruction, Native American tools or artifacts from the German World War II prisoner of war camp may be found. Conservation experts agree that a record storm of this magnitude naturally leads to flooding and erosion. After all, this beautiful Blufflands landscape was sculpted by water erosion. But there are land use practices we can implement to slow water runoff and lessen the frequency and severity of floods. These include maintaining ground cover by planting cover crops, buffer strips, pasture and hay for livestock, and native vegetation. Since we can't totally eliminate floods, parks like Whitewater are a good use for floodplains. These low lands slow floodwaters and store them temporarily, making floods less intense for communities downstream. It costs less to repair a park's recreation area than a business district or housing development. As a park, the floodplain landscape can be enjoyed with reduced risk to people and property. In Whitewater State Park, we can also observe and learn from these natural forces that shaped and continue to shape the river valley today. Whitewater State Park was a great state park before the flood. And as you'll see as you explore, it is still a great state park today, just a different great state park.